What is up, y'all? Welcome back to Fish the Moment, another Fish the Moment live stream. Tonight, I'm flying solo, and I want to talk about a really interesting topic that I started thinking about after watching some reruns of Major League Fishing Cup events, specifically one that was on Lake Waco down in Texas. As I was watching the event, I started making this connection between certain types of cover and structure, they're more likely to hold schools of bass. And I want to explain how you can actually differentiate these types of cover and structure and utilize them to either catch numbers of fish or size of fish and kind of change the way you think about how you approach a fishing day. I think a lot of guys just go out fishing and think, I'm just going to fish whatever cover shows up in front of me or if I'm fishing down a bank, if there's a dock or a laydown or a stick up, I'm just going to fish that and not worry too much about it. But I think if we're, you're a little bit more selective about which types of cover you're fishing and fish them with purpose, you can have a lot more success on the water. So that's the topic for today's stream. Before we get into it, a couple things really quick. First, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Bridgeford here. Bridgeford Food sponsors Fish Moment Podcast every single week. Helps make this possible. If you guys want a great snack for the boat, definitely head over to your local Walmart or gas station and pick up some Bridgeford beef jerky. Also, every week we do a giveaway for a free case of Bridgeford beef jerky on this live stream. And I pick a random commenter at some point throughout the stream. So definitely be leaving some good comments if there's a good question or just something out there that I find interesting. I'll pick one commenter on the live video and give them a free case of Bridgeford beef jerky sent straight from Bridgeford. Their sponsor for tonight's live stream is The Bass Tank. And actually next week we have John Sukup, the owner of The Bass Tank, and just a hammer overall. He's going to be joining us for the next week's live stream to talk a little bit about his tournament season and how he kind of prepares for uh, tournament season with different rods electronics, all those different things. So for tournament guys, I think it'll be some really good detailed tournament info for you. If you guys are interested though in getting any sort of electronics for your boat, whether that is a fish finder for regular down imaging and side imaging or a live scope unit, head over to the BassTankTalk.com and check out their website. They have a great deal going on right now that's been rolling for a while now. And if you guys haven't taken advantage, you better before it uh, completely goes away. They currently have a, a unit right now. It's a Echo Map UHD 93 SV for $1,099. So basically, two grand. You can get a nine inch unit with a live scope, and it's a great deal. So definitely check that out, guys, if you are interested. Or you can give them a call at their number, which is area code 918 509 7864. Again, that's 918 509 7864. Awesome. So let's jump right into it, guys, and not waste too much time. I want to get into this topic and just start talking fishing. The last couple of weeks, I feel like we've been talking about a lot of stuff that's not just, you know, straight up bass fishing. So I want to just spend an hour just nerding out with you guys and sharing a theory I had. I'm going to get comments from you guys, hopefully, and uh, you guys are going to be, um, uh, you know, hopefully give me some good feedback so I can build this theory and I don't know, it's kind of just like in the works. I don't know if it's fully fleshed out yet, but I think it could be interesting. So to set the scene of why I even thought about this in the first place, let's take a look at Lake Waco down in Texas. This is just a standard lowland reservoir. Got a dam section here, um, some creek arms that are varying in size. The primary cover on this lake is going to be either man-made riprap, which we have kind of in this section right here, so some man-made riprap, or you're going to have back in these creeks <clears throat> a lot of standing timber. So you'll have a lot of standing timber out in the middle of the lake that makes navigation somewhat tricky, but it's you know basically great cover for bass if you can find them in it. So what I was realizing when I was watching this Major League Fishing Cup show, and you can actually watch this, guys, on the, uh, I think it's My Outdoor Network's YouTube channel, or you can just look up Major League Fishing Cup event, Lake Waco. You should be able to find that. And you can see the event I'm talking about. It's free on YouTube right now. And what they were... Basically, these guys were doing is they had to make the decision when the uh, pros launched, and you got like Jacob Wheeler, you had um, Andy Morgan, KVD, uh, all really good anglers out there, um, Wesley Strader, a bunch of guys just hammering them on this lake. But the fishing was kind of tough overall. So I think the cut weight on one of the days out here was like 14 pounds for you know the weight that they need to catch to actually make it out of the round. So 14 pounds is not a lot of weight. 
They're fishing there, I think, in the fall time of the year. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on the exact time. I think it was the fall. And a lot of guys were getting into the trap of running back in these creeks and trying to fish this beautiful standing timber that's out here. There's standing timber out in the middle of the lake. There's a lot of stick-ups and shoreline cover. I mean, there's just stuff everywhere. I mean, if we kind of change the angle on this, you can just see there's just cover everywhere. It's just one of those really fishy looking areas. And they were going through these areas, they're going through them and they were really struggling to catch fish. They catch one fish here, one fish there. And all of a sudden they get in a little like grouping or a little pod of fish, or maybe in this general area, they would catch four or five fish. And that's very typical with this type of cover. You're going to have a lot of water that's basically dead water. And then you're going to have a little zone, maybe you know, the size of your boat, maybe two boats sizes where most of the fish are going to group up in a massive area. This is very challenging though to break apart because you have to just put a lure in the water and just fish, which is not always the most effective way to find fish quickly or find them consistently. Therefore, the predominant strategy that really ended up helping Wesley Strader win his round, at least when I was watching, is he went into some of these marinas, some of these boat docks in this area and when he got in these boat docks he was able to catch fish consistently under these docks and even go back and kind of refish some of these boat docks and catch them really well and it was pretty interesting because no one else really got in this pattern right off the bat a lot of guys are fishing riprap which is also a great place they can hold fish but it's not necessarily always going to hold a school of fish. There might be fish scattered throughout the riprap, but on some of these boat docks, it seems like there may have been two, three, four fish, five, six fish under catchable fish, for example, underneath like one of these boat docks. And maybe in this whole boat dock here, there might be 30 or 40 bass with five or six catchable bass under one of these boat docks. Now, these are obviously very big boat docks here down south, but the same idea applies. So this was kind of the idea that Wesley Strader stumbled across was fishing boat docks on this lake. Well, if we go to another lake on another cup event that I watched, it was uh, actually one of my uh, home stomping grounds, Lake Winnebago up in Wisconsin, uh, the Winnicani chain. And I actually grew up fishing here, guys. I've, I finished, uh, I think, second or third in a Fishers of Men tournament here with my partner uh, when I was like 11 years old fishing uh, old Winnicani and Winnebago here. So I got a lot of actual tournament experience out here, which is pretty, uh, pretty cool. But they were fishing this section right here of Lake Winnebago, and Edwin Evers won this um, round. And what he was doing is he was fishing these main lake boat docks. And I don't know if these are the exact stretch he was fishing, guys. I, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't paying attention enough to know exactly which stretch he was fishing. But he basically was fishing these main lake boat docks. And same exact thing happened, guys. A lot of the anglers were going down these banks uh, or these areas just fishing stuff like this where you have trees, overhangs, maybe a little bit of rock on some islands, just down these banks, just kind of fishing. They were maybe fishing some of the shallow grass, trying to get a feel for what's going on, and even getting to some of the canals and stuff that had some grass. And they just were really struggling to catch fish the majority of the field. The only two that really got on the fish were Edwin Evers and Mike McClellan, who were able to get into some of these boat docks, and they were catching fish off these boat docks, but not just one. They were catching three, four, five fish per boat dock. And these docks are not really that much. They're just some metal poles that stick in the water. But Edwin sat on one dock and caught seven or eight fish, which is pretty crazy. So these docks are obviously holding a good quantity of fish, and everyone else is struggling. So that got me thinking, and this is kind of where my theory is. This is a long-winded way to get into it, but my got me thinking about what happens on fisheries this is a northern fishery here lake waco is a th southern fishery it seems like there's some correlation between the types of areas these guys are catching them in major league fishing and the you know the what is holding schools of fish versus holding just individual fish and what i came up with is i came up with this little slide deck here and i'm just going to kind of give you this um to show you here this is just a slide I put together uh, on the fly. And what it basically is, is breaking up types of cover that I feel like hold schools of fish. We have shallow areas or shallow pieces of cover, offshore pieces of cover that hold schools of fish. Why is this important? Well, when you're fishing 
on just a regular fishing day, guys, and I do this in my Catch 15 challenges all the time, I always have more success when I catch a uh, fish off of areas that have a school of fish versus areas that have isolated cover on them. If I give you an example here um, on Grand Lake, I'll just scroll back over to Grand Lake here, down in Oklahoma where I do some of my Catch 15 challenges. What I'll find a lot of times is that, especially when I would fish against Randy in our Catch 15 or our like challenge videos and stuff, Randy would always try to fish isolated cover in the backs of some of these pockets and coves. And those isolated pieces of cover could be like a little lay down here, out in the middle of nowhere, another little stick up here, maybe a small little patch of rock like this. Um, a s isolated boat dock or boat ramp, but not really necessarily like a uh, an area that's going to hold big groupings of fish. It's just a one here, one there approach. And at times, this can be very effective if you hit it right, where you can hit enough pieces of isolated cover, you have enough of them to yourself, and you have enough time to get five bites off of them. Problem is that most of the time, we're not fishing on these lakes by ourselves. So if you fish a big area like this, there might be 30 isolated targets that hold fish. Well, if there's 10 guys fishing in this general area and you divide those 30 spots, now you get three spots maybe to yourself where you get the first cast on that piece of cover. If you're fishing with nobody around, maybe potentially you could, you know, make that happen. And then you have to factor in, are you throwing the right bait? Even if there's 30 catchable fish, maybe some of them only bite a spinner bait, some of them only bite a square bill, some of them only bite a Texas rig versus a jig, whatever it is. So you also have to have your bait selection dialed in. And you're basically fishing for one fish per target. And that makes it really, really challenging because those fish on isolated pieces of cover, like an isolated rock or something like that, they are feeding solely out of their own instincts, like their personal instincts. Like let's say we pull up on um, this laydown right here. If a bass is sitting on this laydown, if it's the only one there, you have to f trigger that fish to bite for whatever reason with what you're doing with your lure, whether it's bouncing it off the stump the right way, throwing it multiple times across the stump, trying to trigger one of those reaction bites. On the flip side, when you're fishing on an area where you have a school of fish, let's say um, I'm fishing out here off of a point. Let's say that, that there's a point that runs out here and there's a um, like a ledge and you have some fish sitting out here on this ledge. If there's seven, eight, nine, ten bass in this area, those bass are going to be competitive to try to get your bait. And you, instead of trying to get one fish to change its mind about feeding or not feeding, you're having seven or eight fish that are getting competitive for your bait, and it makes them much easier to catch. It makes them easier to trigger. They want to get that bait before the other fish in that area actually get the bait or get a chance at it. So you're dealing with this group mentality, the schooling, schooled up fish mentality, making them easier to catch and making them a little bit more consistent in terms of, you know, are they going to bite or not? Also, if you have a school of fish here, there's a chance you might catch two or three fish off of this one area versus catching one fish here, one fish there. And if you look at a lot of these major league fishing events, guys, where these guys are fishing one day, no practice on these lakes, they are in general catching fish the best off of these areas where there's schools of fish, where multiple fish will group up. There are the exceptions on really tough days when guys will pick a fish up here, the fish up there, just kind of one and two them to death, kind of randomly running around. That sometimes happens. But if you look at the guys who really, you know, consistently catch them pretty well in these major league fishing events, they're catching two, three, four fish off one little area, then going to another spot, catching two, three, four fish off of that area as well, finding these groupings of fish. And this is what I was getting at with this PowerPoint. When you're fishing up shallow, you can still catch fish in schools if you're fishing around the right type of cover. And then obviously offshore, you can also catch fish that are schooled up on certain types of cover. And I've just kind of listed out the ones that have, I've noticed from tournaments, from myself, personal experience, stuff like that, of types of cover that will get fish grouped up and schooled up in a specific spot. The shallow water pieces of cover that I've noticed are going to be lily pads, boat docks, and more specifically marina boat docks more than anything, or if you have a really big boat dock. I'm not talking about like a little like, sometimes in Wisconsin, like the example on Lake Winnebago, um, 
you could have like one little boat dock like this that holds a lot of fish. But most of the time, it's going to be your bigger marina boat docks or a big dock. Next, you have riprap, specifically if it's a bridge there, like a bridge end. Think Lake Gunnersville, Randy Howell fishing the same bridge for the entire day going around one little corner of riprap over and over and over again. So you have like a bridge with riprap area and then also matted vegetation. If you have matted grass, grass mats. Those are the shallow water areas that I find will hold schools of fish. And honestly, it's kind of funny because the areas of that I actually have the most confidence in when I'm fishing up shallow are these four. And I never put it together. I never put these pieces together before of why when I fish shallow, I like to fish lily pads a lot. I've had a lot of tournament success back in the day on lily pads, a lot of tournament success on docks, riprap, and matted grass. These are like my staple four things. If I, if I am going to catch fish up shallow, I'm going to fish one of these four types of cover. And mentally, I don't think I ever made that connection or in my brain that these types of cover are the most similar to offshore fishing than any other types of cover. These four types of cover are more like fishing offshore than anything because on most of the offshore places you're going to fish, you're going to have schools of bass. And on these types of shallow cover, you're also going to have schools of bass. And it's, for me, I feel a lot more comfortable when I'm fishing, when I have when I know I have the ability to catch two or three fish off of an area versus catching one fish here, one fish there. I hate that one, like plunking around, catching one fish here, one fish there. That's not really my style. I don't like doing that. I like to catch multiple fish off of one spot. So with these types of cover, I can definitely achieve that. We also have all these offshore pieces of cover. You guys have heard me talk about offshore structure and stuff all the time. So I'm not going to uh, spend a ton of time on this, but obviously brush piles can hold schools of fish. Standing timber can hold schools of fish, shell beds can hold schools of fish, offshore grass, rock piles, and also just bait fish balls, bass schooling on bait fish. This is pretty well understood. A lot of guys think about these areas as places that hold groups of fish, more than one fish. But a lot of guys don't think about, I think, these types of shallow water cover holding schools of fish. And I think this might be the key for me to start actually really liking shallow water fishing in that I might be able to become a lot better shallow water angler if I pick my battles as opposed to just fishing random stuff up shallow when I go say I'm gonna go fish shallow I'm just gonna go fish something and say I'm trying to do that and just picking up a fish here or there if I only go up shallow when I have one of these four options available to me it's going to be more comfortable and it's going to probably be more successful for me. And I think the reason that I always got, I gravitated to these types of cover, especially in my region of the country, but I've fished up north too in Wisconsin uh, for half my life as well with all the grass mats and stuff. And I've, I mean, I've won, I've won junior state tournament uh, fishing lily pads. I've won a junior state tournament fishing boat docks. I've won a junior state tournament fishing uh, the... Uh, riprap uh, around bridges before and I finished second or third in a high school fishing world finals fishing grass mats before so I have a lot of tournament success shallow on these types of cover so I think there's something to that now obviously there's not going to be boat docks lily pads matted grass or you know bridges of rock on every lake all the time so I can kind of pick my battles but I wanted to go around some of the lakes that I fish regularly and just kind of give you an idea of how potentially prevalent this stuff might be and how I could apply it and maybe it'll help you guys as well um, you know when you go uh, try to apply this for your lake so I'm just going to pull up this let me actually get this over here let me know guys if this is interesting too because this is just me kind of uh, I, I don't get to talk fishing with too many people because I don't really have that many friends that fish so you guys are my friends right now I'm just sharing like my personal thoughts and opinions and stuff like that. So let me know if you guys uh, are, are finding this interesting. So uh, first lake we can go to is Beaver Lake. Beaver Lake is my arch nemesis. I hate Beaver Lake because of two factors. One, Beaver Lake is a great shallow-ish water lake where you can just run the bank and catch fish. And that's where a lot of the largemouth live is up shallow. But there's not a lot of the four types of cover that I really like to fish. So as we said before, the four types of cover that I'm looking for are your lily pads, your boat docks, your riprap, and the 
um, matted grass. So that's really what I'm looking for. Well, there's no lily pads or matted grass in Beaver Lake, so I'm ruling that out. Next, we have riprap. And there's a few places with riprap, but not just riprap, but specifically a bridge. There's this bridge right here, which gets absolutely hammered by everyone who fishes on this lake. And I've never caught a fish there, and I fish it all the time, so I don't really feel like that's a deal. This bridge is not connecting anything, and then we have like this bridge down here. So there's like two, maybe three bridges on this entire lake that potentially could hold fish, and I don't ever catch fish um, on these types of cover. So on Beaver Lake, I'm kind of SOL on the road bridge pattern. Next, we have boat docks. That's the other option, because that's the only two options we have on this lake. Well, this marina here has some boat docks, but it's off limits in tournaments. But there are a bunch of boat docks on this lake in some of these creeks. If you look at some of these creeks, boat docks all through here, all the way through the back, there's boat docks and a couple of these other creeks in here. And now that I come to think about it, guys, I hardly ever fish boat docks on beaver. I don't know why. I have no idea why I never fish boat docks on beaver, but there are boat docks like all around this lake. And I'm thinking about it now and I'm always trying to fish what everyone else is doing on beaver. I'm always trying to fish the rock transitions and fish the backs of the pockets and the coves. And I try all this stuff. I don't, I don't freaking catch them. And I am always frustrated, but I also never fish boat docks. And I'm thinking to myself, why am I not fishing boat docks when I'm confident in them? I know they can hold groups of fish. And I feel like it could be a really good pattern for me. I know that they, you know, these docks will hold fish on them. I mean, they are all over the place in good water. And I've caught them on table rock and I've caught them on both shoals. I've caught them all over the place on boat docks. Just I've never really fished boat docks on beaver because I never hear too many people catching fish on boat docks on beaver. And now I'm getting into the whole thing of I'm, I'm kind of getting into the dock talk, listening to whatever everyone else is saying work is working versus just going and trying it and doing it for myself. So that's bad on me. So what I'm thinking about, guys, is I'm like, okay, if I go fish on beaver going forward, and I'm going to fish up shallow, because that's where all the good largemouth are in general, I need to figure out a boat dock pattern. Now, boat dock fishing is not necessarily um, the most... It's not the easiest way to actually go about catching fish in general, because... What you'll find with boat dock fishing, and I, I love boat dock fishing. It's like one of my favorite ways to catch them up shallow. But boat docks are not going to be firing on every section of every lake all over the place. Usually there's a specific water clarity and a specific bank angle you need on your boat docks that is going to eliminate a lot of the lake. For example, if we go into this creek right here, we have very flat banks on these boat docks. These boat docks are very, very flat on flat sloping banks. This could be really good at certain times or it could be really bad. If they're not on flat sloping banks and they're not in this water clarity, you're not going to catch any fish off these boat docks. But if you go one pocket over, you have some boat docks on some very steep banks. And even though fish could be on boat docks specifically, you might run through this entire pocket and never catch a single fish. But then all of a sudden, if you get to this steep boat dock right here, here, these three right here, that's where you're going to get all your bites on those few key boat docks in this water clarity. There's also a chance there, though, that you fish down these boat docks and these boat docks and you don't catch anything. And that's because this whole section of the lake, just the boat docks aren't playing because of the water clarity or the, the certain phase those fish are in. And maybe you need to be fishing boat docks in this creek. This is the creek where the boat docks are firing. And what you'll notice is, or I've noticed at least, is Boat dock fish are not that hard to catch when you get your bait around them. The challenge is getting your bait in there. You have to skip your bait. And I love I love skip casting. It's one of my favorite things to do growing up. So if you can skip a jig really well or like skip a wacky rig worm or a fluke or fish like a jerk bait out in front of them, stuff like that, those fish will tell you pretty quick if there's fish on these boat docks. You don't have to really sit there and like grind on them. You make two, three casts in the shadiest parts of the boat docks, like skipping a jig, or maybe fish the back walkways, make your way around, cast two or three times behind the walkways, or maybe hit like this back little corner. If you do that on four, five, six docks that look the same in this pocket, usually that's a pretty good indicator if there's going to be fish there. If you catch, if you fish five or six boat docks and don't get bit on the same slope, in the same water clarity, in the same section of the lake, move, leave, don't worry about fishing them. That's just what I found. It's not, not just worth it, really. 
Another thing that can really help you on these boat docks is bass are going to get into these boat docks if there's forage underneath them. And specifically, there's two times of the year where the bait fish will get in and around these boat docks really heavy. One is the pre-spawn. And you'll actually find that you'll get groups of gizzard shad and threadfin shad that will be up around these boat docks back in here. And you'll be able to see them around the banks or up on the, around the floats. And also in the late summer. Now in the late summer, you're not going to find the big gizzard shad and the big thread fins. You'll actually find these tiny little balls of, sh uh, tiny little shad in these balls. And you'll, if you find little, small little balls of shad that are like one or two inches long swimming around these boat docks, that stretch of boat docks probably has some fish around it. You also might find that the bluegill will spawn around these docks, but it's a lot less consistent because those brim bed fish the brim beds could be anywhere around any of these docks. So one of these docks could have a brim bed right here, and this dock is awesome with that brim bed right there. But if there's no brim bed around any of the other boat docks around here, this is the only dock that's going to be good. So that's a little bit sketch. So what I do is I, I only fish boat docks really when I know that there's bait around them or if there's some sort of, um, you know, it's like the right season for it, where I know like pre-spawn, kind of late summertime, that's when I really like to fish the boat docks, even in the winter, if there's shad around those docks. But there needs to be some shad around the boat docks, at least my area of the lake. Up north, you want to find your perch. If the perch are up around those boat docks, they'll sit in the grass, they'll be up around the docks. If you can see the perch and see the sunfish around the boat docks, they will kind of get around one boat dock a little bit more up north and you'll find groups of fish, more groups of fish. We're here on like down south with the brim beds down here. You may only have one or two bass on this boat dock, but up north, if you find perch and sunfish around your uh, boat dock, there may be 30 bass on that one dock. So that's just some, some thoughts there. So with all that being said, um, uh, let me read, I'm, I'm not reading any of these comments over here. Um, let's see here. I think everyone's saying, I don't know what people are saying. People are, uh, people are saying like the video. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. I'm glad that people are, uh, are, are liking nerding out with me. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so a question over here though, from, um, from BK, he asked, are floating docks or pylon docks better? Okay, so this is really weird. I always hated fishing floating docks. Like here on Beaver, there's floating docks. I grew up up in Wisconsin fishing the metal pilings and the wood piling docks. And that's what I always preferred to fish. But what I noticed about docks, guys, is a lot of times these fish are not setting up on the dock because of the poles going into the bottom of the lake. They're setting up there because of the shade. And you're going to get just as much shade cast from a floating dock as you will from a piling dock that's stuck into the ground. Those pylons will give you a target to kind of pitch at, and so it's kind of nice. But as long as you're getting that bait in the shaded zone, the shaded area, that's what those fish are relating to on the boat dock. Not the actual dock posts or poles themselves. It's the shade of the dock. And that's really key on dock fishing too. You want to make sure that you really focus on the sides of the dock where the shade is hitting. So for example, this side of the dock right here is getting hit directly by the sun, this direction. This side of the dock is not going to be nearly as productive because it's getting hit directly by the sun as this side of the boat dock. Because not only is that sun hitting the boat dock here and casting the shadow that you can visibly see, it's also casting a shadow under the water out to probably about here. And a lot of the fish I catch on boat docks on my jigs and jerk baits, stuff like that, you won't see a shade line right here on the dock. But if you cast out in front of this dock here and the sun's hitting this side, the right side, and the left side is where the shade shadow is being cast, that shadow, especially on deeper docks, will extend into the water and actually go further from the dock than you would think it would. And this is where a lot of those fish will set up, is even like just down the side of the dock here. And so a lot of times I actually just catch fish on like a jig or a jerkbait, just throwing the jig just down the dock and just working it this way. And I'm fishing that shade line, not just fishing the boat dock itself. That's a little gem for you guys right there. Um, wind direction factor. I don't really like fishing docks too much if there's a lot of wind, unless the wind is blowing straight down like a chute. Um, like if the wind is blowing like straight down this direction from, uh, let me draw this here. If it's going like this in there from like the, uh, Northeast, 
these all these docks, that wind is going straight across the front of them. Sometimes that can be really good to like slow roll a spinner bait or an Alabama rig or a jerk bait and fish it out in front of these boat docks if that wind is kind of paralleling them. Sometimes I've done that on like Lake Hamilton a few times, stuff like that. But it's not I normally don't like to fish docks when there's too much wind. Uh, normally I'll get away from the wind and get in these protected pockets where the wind is just not a factor. That's just my personal preference. So that is um Let's see here. Hopefully people are enjoying. <laughs> Hopefully I'm just seeing I'm not seeing too many comments. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this or giving me feedback or thoughts. I'm just talking, so I, I can't read the chat while I'm talking. Normally when I have a guest I can at least see what you guys are saying, but hopefully you guys are uh uh you know, hopefully that makes sense. So let me go to another lake. So we got uh, Beaver Lake. Let's go to a lake that's not necessarily so dock heavy and like Highland Reservoir. So let's go over here to Kerr Reservoir. This is a lake I like to fish off the Arkansas River. And on Old Kerr, you have very few docks. And let me pull up that graphic again that we were showing. These are the types of cover that are the shallow cover that I'm covering right now. They're like the ones that I feel like hold groupings of fish. So on Kerr, don't really have a lot of boat docks. There are a few boat docks, and I'll kind of show you where they are. With, but I know that Matt Pangrek actually called them I have boat docks before on Kerr. So maybe there's a little bit of a boat dock deal, but nothing crazy. And then there's not really any matted grass out there. So you're dealing mainly with lily pads and with riprap slash bridges. That's kind of going to be your schools of fish area. And when I'm thinking back to all the times I catch them on Kerr, I catch them around lily pads or around riprap uh, or around bridges. So it's kind of interesting because... This is all like this whole theory I'm coming up with with the shallow water is pretty interesting. Um, so if I pull this back up, so let's take a look at Kerr. Let me pull up a time when it's not the middle of the winter, hopefully. So we can kind of see this. Let's see here. Maybe there's not a good image of this. Oh, here we go. Okay. So here's Kerr. So um, if we take a look at Kerr, here's the area where there's a couple of marina boat docks and like maybe you could catch some fish here, but there's just like not enough boat docks to make it like a big player on this lake. But back in some of these creeks, especially back in like this area in here, you can see we got some pads. These are lily pads right here. And man, I love pad fishing. There's a few lily pads like way back in here. You got some pad action in here and if you guys don't have any lily pads in your area i'm very sorry um i love pad fishing and it's so sad because i used to pad fish on dardanelle all the time like dardanelle and all the pads are gone and it's really sad because i love pad fishing on dardanelle and i'm not finding good let me go actually down to dardanelle i'll just pull some historical stuff from there because that's probably a better example uh that people are going to cr be crying about this because these pads are now gone I loved fishing all these pads around the islands on uh, Goose Island. If you guys have fished Dardanelle before and you you know, if you know, you know about Goose Island pad stems in the spring with the Alabama rig, if anyone knows that one, that's pretty good. But um, basically, if you go through here on these pads fields, what will happen is that these fish will group up in small little sections, like right in here right in here and there'll be a little zone maybe it's even a pocket further back and it's kind of hard to predict exactly where they're going to be but there's usually a little wad of them where the bass are going to be and i love fishing lily pads because when you get in a zone with them you can just camp out and just fish that little area and just hammer them and i finished third in the high school fishing world finals on lake dardanelle in the summer of 250 boats fishing pads one year and i love it and basically what we were doing is we did a combination of frog fishing and then flipping a really heavy one ounce jig into the pads. And it was only like four foot of water, but it was pretty fun fishing. And what happens is that in these lily pads, you basically just have a big field of pads. And certain points, my thought is that either the shad get in there for whatever reason, a lot of times the shad will get in there or the bluegill will start spawning in one little specific zone or spot. And every year the pads kind of shift and change, like how good they're growing in one place or how far out they grow. And usually that moves the fish around every year. They're not always in the exact spot every single time. But when you find that little zone, they will stay there for sometimes a week or 
week and a half, and they'll stay in that zone, then they'll move, and you have to relocate them. But I love pad fishing because you're going to be able to potentially get a limit of fish or two or three limits of fish out of a 20, 30, 40 yard stretch of pads. And these fish will kind of have a, a mood shift. So it'll happen, especially if you have like a stretch like this in the pads, where they're in this zone. What you'll find is that in the morning, those fish will be more on the outside edge. And you can catch them more on like a buzz bait or like a horny toad, something like that. It's a moving top water. And then as the day progresses and the, the wind calms down, maybe the sun pops out, and as it gets calmer and sunnier, those fish will pu- push further back into these pads to the point where they might be on this very inside edge, like right where this yellow marker is, like way in here. And you either have to bomb a frog in there or like get up in there and flip them. And that's super fun. I, I love doing that. Just braided line, hammering them. Um, one of my favorite ways to fish. But you kind of have to play the wind. Like if the wind is running into these pads, a lot of times those fish will move further out, more towards the edge. Again, calmer and sunnier, they move into the pads. And all the pads on Dardanelle have got like washed away from all the crazy high water we've had. And I'm just, I want one year where the pads grow back on Dardanelle because I love fishing. I mean, there used to be pads, like all this stuff used to be awesome. There used to be pads all back in here. Um, all oh, this stuff, oh man, bring back good memories. Pads way back in here, like, man, it was so good back in the day, fishing pads on Dardanelle. But, um, yeah, not, not anymore. I did it like one year, a couple of years ago. I had a video on it where I caught like a five pounder fishing some pads when there was like very few pads left. But I love fishing pads, uh, one of my favorite ways to fish. And it's definitely a great way that holds a large, uh, can hold a large school of fish, which is what we're looking for. Um, let's see here. There's a question from Ron that I think someone said was good. I don't, I didn't see that. Ron, sorry. Someone said you had a good question. I missed it. I apologize. It's hard to, when I'm flying solo, it's hard to go through here. Um, Uh, Alan said earlier that uh, he finds some days are on the floating docks and some days are on the docks with the poles. Yeah, some days it's it's crazy. Um, so it's sometimes these fish just get on weird patterns on docks and different things, and it's kind of hard to predict them. And that's the other thing too. I was going to talk about Dardanelle. Dardanelle, we have uh, the pads, but then you also have the riprap. And riprap can be a great place as long, especially if there's a bridge. If there's like a riprap in the mouth of a creek, that's like your key. If you're going to find fish grouped up on riprap like this, if there's a bridge that goes across or like a road that goes across the mouth of a major creek, this is just a great funnel place for bass to come in and they come out and they come in and they come out. And as long as you hit them in the right times of year, usually pre-spawn, post-spawn, and fall, <clears throat> these bridges are going to be absolutely on fire because all the fish have to, if they want to get out back out here to the main lake, they have to swim through this bridge or back out. And they're going to set up on these corners of these riprap and stuff like that. And a lot of guys don't get that you can actually catch fish on these bridges right behind other guys because there's so many fish on these spots that they're just moving in and up and in and out all the time. A lot of guys think that you have to, like if there's a guy who's fishing here and they've just got done fishing it, oh, that spot's ruined, that guy just caught all the fish that were going to be there. That's definitely not the case, especially because a lot of guys will come by and just fish like a square bill or a spinner bait or something down these roads where I'll a lot of times come in and throw a black shaky head behind people. I'll throw a little bit deeper diving like a, like a Bandit 300 or Bandit 200 crankbait down these riprap banks like a little bit deeper and put on like a spinning rod sometimes and like get it really deep or like a flat side crankbait, crank it in like that six to eight foot range. And you can go literally right behind people all the time all the time and catch fish and randy actually i put randy onto that for the uh, open he fished on dardanelle last year and he finished 13th place and lost some fish and i was like randy just go fish behind people on the roads and bridges on dardanelle's post spawn he finished 13th so um got some home cooking here from johnny on the uh on the dardanelle open so uh it works i can we, i have proof that it works from randy fishing the open it works against the top level competition and he was throwing a little tiny crankbait uh, like a little small crankbait on these roads and bridges, uh, which everyone was throwing bigger square bills, and he was throwing a really small crankbait on a spinning rod, and that's how he was able to go right behind people and just catch them. Um, 
let's see here. There's another question I saw over here. Um, are there always schools of fish in smaller bodies of water or only sometimes? I find there's always schools of fish as long as you have these types of cover structure in your lake. And Ron asked a good question about the offshore cover. Are there certain ones that are better than others in specific seasons? It really depends on lake type. It depends on the water clarity. It depends on where the cover is located within the creeks. For example, you're not always going to have good standing timber in every section of every lake or even at all. And sometimes it's too deep, sometimes it's a little bit too shallow, or it's actually sticking up out of the water. So it's very dependent on the scenario. Same thing with like brush piles. These are man-made, so if your lake just doesn't have a lot of man-made brush piles, it's just not going to be a really big pattern. Or there's a point where maybe there's too many brush piles, and they're literally everywhere, like on some lakes around my area now, where the people have gone brush pile crazy, and they've ruined good offshore areas because they throw just piles of brush on them and there's just too much crap down there now. So a lot of times it's not that great if there's like too much of this stuff. Shell beds. In general, shell beds are going to be best during post-spawn, pre-spawn, and summertime. Even getting into the late summer, shell beds can be good. They're not as good in the winter, unless you have like a warm water lake, like warm water discharge or some current flow, you can catch them on the shell beds then. Shell beds are kind of good year round, but they're, they really shine pre-spawn, post-spawn, summer, late summer. Offshore grass year round, just amazing, always holds fish north to south. It's really hard to find fish in offshore grass, I'll talk about that here in a second, but it's really good. Um, rock piles. Always going to hold fish if you can find an isolated rock pile. Not rock everywhere. You want like an area where there's smooth bottom and all of a sudden a big chunk rock area. That's what you're looking for there. And then sometimes bass will get screwed, schooled up on bait fish like Bull Shoals Lake, Table Rock Lake, they do it. But that's not that every lake sort of thing. So a lot of this is very dependent on the scenario and the situation. Um, and kind of a shameless plug, guys, if you want to figure out like which of these offshore covers and shallow water covers are the most effective or which ones um, are going to be good on your lake or your situation let me actually um let me go back over here give me a second i need to pull this up i should have this up already give me a second um okay here we go so if you guys want to check this out, you can actually go over to the uh, new app I just uh, launched a couple weeks ago, the Deep Dive app. You guys have heard about it. But the Deep Dive app, all of the stuff that you're talking about, Ron, all your questions, it's all captured here in the Deep Dive app. And one thing I didn't really explain, I've, I've explained it, but I don't think I'm really getting it across with the app, guys. And it's basically an app that what I did is I pulled tournament data from real tournaments and I basically use that to create a database of strategies so that everything in here is backed up by like real results. It's not backed up by just random whatever. It's like there's real results that are backed up by this app. And what you can do is you get all of your weather conditions, um, the current flow, frontal conditions, wind, all this stuff is automatically calculated and, and pulled into the app. And all you have to do is input your water clarity, water temperature, whether you run a fish in wind protected or, or non-wind protected areas, and if there's offshore grass or grass in the lake in general. You can then select if you want fish shallow or deep, and you get recommended strategies along with like where to fish, with cover and structure recommendations. They are tailored to your lake type, the water temperature, the water level, the season of the year, all those factors, and they all come into effect. So I could sit here and say, hey, the brush piles are good on this situation or this situation. It's already calculated here in the app. I spent two and a half years getting this right. So if you have any questions for me about like what, when should I fish rock piles versus brush piles or anything like that, the app literally has everything. It's all it's all in here. It's all based on like, you know, 10 years of tournament data from multiple tours. It's it's really, really solid data, guys. It adjusts to the current conditions. You can see future forecasts of what the fish are going to be doing. We're actually going to be launching a new update here very soon. We're actually going to give um, an effectiveness rating for different strategies to see like if it which baits are the most effective based on the you know the results and the information we have to say this bait is the most effective right now. We'll actually rank the strategies to say this strategy is the most effective versus you know maybe the second most effective stuff like that. And so you're going to be able to get ranked 
you know, the bait cover structure combination, which one is the most effective in that moment. So you can check all those guys out at the deep dive app website. It's just deepdiveapp.com or just type in deep dive on the Apple app store, Google play store. You can download the app. Um, so enough shameless promotions there. Let me, uh, let me go back over here and keep talking. Um, let's see here. Where are we going? Sorry guys. It's I'm, I'm slow because of all this. Um, uh, M Jones, have you thought about maybe fishing some Toyota series or bass opens? I've actually thought about it guys. Um, recently more so than not, uh, one of the, okay. I gotta tell you, uh, this is a true story. You can, you can take it or leave it. But, um, if you go to one of my recent videos, if you watch the tackle warehouse pro circuit event, that was fished on Sam Rayburn Lake. Michael Neal won the event and he caught 26 pounds in the last day. And if you go into one of my recent YouTube videos, I was talking about where you should be fishing, the types of cover and types of things you should be looking for on your on your lakes. And Michael Neal caught his fish out of offshore ditches. Now I was saying the best winter time spots are offshore ditches. And this is kind of the set of ditches, I don't know exactly which one he was fishing, but it was one of these three ditches in the mouth of Mud Creek where he was catching his fish right here. And in a video I posted two weeks before the Bassmaster Open, literally two weeks before the or before the Toyota Series event, or the it was the Pro Circuit event, Pro Circuit event at Rayburn, I was talking about how you should be fishing ditches, and this is the ditch I used as an example right here. And the only reason I use this one is because it looks better on Google Earth. This is probably the better ditch. This is the one that I really liked, but I was doing it for example purposes. But regardless, I was saying fish ditches, and I literally picked the exact creek and the exact structure in the mouth of this creek where Michael Neal won the tournament. Now, if I was going out there and practicing for the tournament, I wouldn't just graph these ditches. I would have graphed these ditches right here too. But you can go back and watch the video. These are the ditches I used in my example. Michael Neal caught his fish out of these ditches right here. So... I was almost spot on in the exact pattern, the location, everything on the lake a week before. So uh, maybe just, I'm just saying. So like I, I was after that and I've done that a couple times. Like obviously a couple more Randy with the opens. Like I feel like I could, uh, I could do it if I really, really wanted to. But right now with, it's so hard to do, um, just do fish the moment and do everything right now. Maybe if the deep dive app is very successful and I don't have to worry so much about making videos every week and all that stuff, maybe I'll give it a shot one day. Um, not for much for so much for a competitive perspective. That's not really as exciting to me. Like I don't really care that people like I'm winning tournaments or something like that. The thing that's interesting to me about it is I would love to be able to figure out how fishing pressure affects fish. And it's really hard to do that fishing on like a Saturday, even like on a Grand Lake when there's a bunch of boats out there, but there's only been practicing for like a day. I know one of the big things about the opens that's really interesting is that guys will practice for four days before an open or a Toyota series. And that pressure, fishing pressure will completely change bass behavior, completely change it. And I've never had to deal with that. So I think if I was going out to the opens, I think I could know where to fish. I know what to throw, all that stuff. But I think that it would be a really big adjustment for me to figure out how to deal with fishing pressure and how to how to kind of do that competitive aspect. So that would be like on Dardanelle or whatever. Everyone's going to be fishing everything. All the good spots are going to be covered up. So how do you approach it to prepare for the fishing pressure, to prepare for everyone fishing the same spots over and over again. And I think that probably I would do bad in some tournaments and I might do good in some tournaments. And I want to be in a position, guys, too, where like, I know you guys are probably who are here an hour into me nerding out about fishing, wouldn't give me crap. But the other thing that's kind of uh, pressure on me is if I go out and let's say fish Dardanelle and I finish 120th in an open out of 100 or 200 guys or 150th out of 200 guys in one open, then the next week I catch bunch of fish and I finish 30th, then I finish 20th, then I finish 150th again because I'm still learning how to do the opens and the fishing pressure. Guys are going to say, look, he had 250th place finishes. He sucks. Well, I also had 230th place finishes, which is really good for the open. And I think the only way that people are going to ever say I'm like a good fisherman is if I go and win an open. And there's guys who fished the Elite Series for years and have never won an open, never won a Bassmaster event, anything like that, and they still fish for a living, and they're really good fishermen. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation for me. If I go out and fish and I do well, people say I got lucky or whatever. If I 
suck in like one or two tournaments or maybe three or the three of the five tournaments they even catch him in two of them catch and don't catch him in three of the five everyone say look he sucks he's just a youtuber he doesn't know what he's doing so it's a lose-lose so at some point if i ever just like don't need the youtube stuff as much to be like supporting my income and stuff maybe if the app takes off maybe i can um you know i can do that and i can try the opens and it's lower risk but right now it's just um it doesn't make any sense for me to do it because it's a lose-lose. I don't expect myself to go out there and like light the world on fire, guys. I mean, I haven't professionally fished or fished tournaments in years. Like, it would take me a while to, um, uh, it would take me a while to understand and get into the groove of like actually fishing a tournament, dealing with the fishing pressure. So, like, my expectation would be I'm gonna bomb some tournaments. I'm gonna do well in some tournaments probably if they're in my wheelhouse. I'm probably gonna have some bad tournaments just because I not didn't make good decisions or it wasn't in it mentally so like my expectations would be i probably would finish like middle of the pack a lot for the first year and it would take me another year to actually get pretty good um that would be my goal or my expectation who knows i could do better but i just that would be and i just don't think that people would accept that they would just say ah he sucks so that's it uh (laughs) uh anyways um so Jesse asks if the if the app is based on tournament patterns, wouldn't that be based on fishing pressure, fishing pressured uh, patterns too? Yeah, so that's that is very true. The thing is, is in the app, guys, is the app is not like the cure all solution. And I'm not trying, I'm not going to BS anybody about what the app is and what it isn't. So like, if we pull up, for example, I was out on um, Ten Killer the other day, Lake Ten Killer over, over here in Oklahoma. So let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about, what I mean by that. So like, I'm on Ten Killer. And I'm fishing um, with the app, and the app tells me I need to fish rock piles in the first half of creeks in the clear water section of Ten Killer. So I go out, I graph the first half of this creek, I run down to the clear water lake, clear water into the lake, I start graphing it through here in the first half of the creek, I get to right here, and I find a group of fish on a rock pile. Right as the app said, the app said fish rock piles, 20 foot of water, first half of the creek, it was perfect. It was exactly set up the way it was supposed to be. Well, I go out and I fish this and I can't get these fish to react. I can't get them to react. I throw the swim bait out there and, I, and I'm and i trying to get it to work. But what I'm doing is I'm throwing a 3-8 ounce head on my swim bait because I thought I was going to be fishing deeper. I cut that off went to a quarter ounce head on the swim bait and caught a fish on my first cast. Those little minute adjustments are hard to capture with all the data. Like I can go through and watch all of these guys patterns and figure out what they're doing but there's always going to be that guy who has that super special retrieve maybe he's like soaking the bait for like a minute in there and i don't know that or i don't know the perfect modification on the bait to make it absolutely like dialed in so there is definitely a lot of room for error in the whole process will it get you close yes but is it going to tell you like put an eighth ounce head reel at this exact perfect way because this is how this guy did it no that's going to be dependent on the fish of that lake that day there's still nuance into it so that's the thing about the app that like is kind of it does take fish fishing pressure into account but even the patterns that they're recommending maybe the only way that pattern works when there's fishing pressure there is if you're throwing an eighth ounce jig head casting out that swim bait and barely reeling it in is that going to be my first instinct no probably not but it's it's definitely you know maybe the way that the pattern was working and it's hard to capture that for every single pattern every single situation so um that's that's what i'm saying um uh let's see here um how i got spooky how spooky how's it going um so oh that's that's a great comment there um from rink he says fishing pressure all the time just means fishing slow or going finesse that's so 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 uh true because if you looked at the first day of the sam rayburn event the first two days michael neal and these guys they were fishing offshore they're i don't know what they're where they're fishing they're let's just say they're fishing like one of the guys was fishing a hard spot he was like somewhere in here i don't know where he was but he was like fishing somewhere in here in harvey creek um is this harvey creek uh i think Maybe I don't even know what. I don't know. I, I I don't know the creek. Yeah, it's Harvey Creek. Okay. So he was fishing like somewhere down like this drop. And you say he found like a hard spot or something out here. I don't know exactly where he was. But the first two days of the tournament, he had to throw a drop shot all day on this hard spot offshore and like drag a Carolina rig with a four foot leader. And there was 220 boats on the lake 
plus apparently there was a 150 boat high school tournament and a 250 boat local tournament. So there was like 500 or 600 boaters on the lake that first couple days of that tournament, which is crazy. And he said the only way you get bit is drop shot, just like soaking a drop shot in there. And he knew the fish were there. They were, you know, good ones. But the only way you get bit is throwing the drop shot. And if you looked at the first two days of the tournament, everybody and their uncle is throwing a fairy wand with a drop shot or a Carolina rig with a four-foot leader. That was like the deal to catch fish the first two days of the tournament. Very few guys were going out there and catching fish on reaction baits. Final day of the tournament, though, there's only 10 guys left on the lake. It's a Sunday, I think, is the final day, or maybe it was, I don't remember, but there wasn't as many tournament guys out there. The same guy, I think he finished second or third, came to the spot that he'd been fishing for three days now, or they only, it was a three day, it was a t- the second day, they canceled one day. So for two days, he'd been fishing with a drop shot. The last day, he comes back and he wrecks him on a crankbait, deep diving crankbait. He said he couldn't buy a bite in a crankbait for the first two days. Because of all the boat pressure, the fishing pressure, just the commotion going around. And it's not even that like guys were fishing the spot. It's that there's boats running everywhere. And I think those fish just kind of get a sense that like, hey, there's something happening today when 27 boats are running by me in the first, you know, 30 minutes of the day. But the last day when it was nice and calm and there was nobody else around, he just rolled up, hammered him on a deep dive and crankbait. Same thing with Michael Neal. He went over to one of these ditches or drains over here in the mouth of Mud Creek and just rolled up, started catching him on a jerk bait, catching him on a swim bait, and he'd been drop shotting all week. And he was able to actually pull out his reaction baits and catch him because of the lack of fishing pressure. And that's one thing that's so critical about these opens and watching these tournaments, guys, is like for most fishermen, like for me, I'm pretty I'm pretty successful fishing a crankbait, a jig, you know, my power baits, because I'm not fishing on that much with that much fishing pressure around. Yeah, I fish on Saturdays a lot, but I mean an 80 boat tournament on Grand Lake is not the equivalent to a uh, 600 tournament boats on Sam Rayburn after two or 300 of those guys have been practicing for four days straight. That is an immense amount of fishing pressure. And so that is like, you have to really adapt and change to that. Finding the fish doesn't really become the problem then. You obviously have to find the fish that are better than better quality. And I feel like I'd be pretty good at finding the fish, but making those adjustments about like, the finesse stuff, I'd have to learn all of that. So yeah, to the point of fishing the opens, like I have, I would have a long way to go to master competitive fishing. I would just probably go, I, I would probably go follow guys around in tournaments and stuff. I was going to go do it and make YouTube videos about it just to like say, how are guys practicing? How are they tournament fishing and like learn, um, before I actually tried it. Cause I'm kind of a perfectionist anyway. So I would want to have an understanding of what I'm doing, not just go out there and just like wing it. That's not my style. Um, any strategies you can speak of for kayak bass fishing tournaments where you can't just bounce around as much, uh, as in a boat. Great question, Aaron. I can answer that for sure. So if you are in a boat or in a kayak and you're not in a boat, and let's just take this example of, um, let's take an example of Beaver Lake over here. So Beaver Lake, if you have a kayak, what I would really recommend you do, and actually let's not use Beaver because I hate Beaver. Um, Let's pull up Grand Lake. So if I was on Grand Lake and I needed to launch my kayak and I had to fish in an area and I had a limited amount of space to fish, my goal would be to find an area with as many possible types of cover and structure combinations as possible. Because if the fish aren't biting on a certain deal, you want the ability to adapt. But... A lot of times, like when I'm fishing on Grand, if I get to the lake and I'm like, hey, I want to catch him on uh, offshore rock. That's just the way I decide to go fish. Well, I know that I have some offshore rock spots like around in this area, and then maybe there's some offshore rock over like over here, and then I got some offshore rock over here, and then I can run all the way here and fish some offshore rock here and in this creek. I can kind of pick and choose, and I will run the offshore rock all around the lake, and I might run 10 mile stretch of the lake, and fish in different water clarities, different sections of the creek, all that stuff. And I'm running a specific type of pattern. I know I want to catch them on offshore rock. That's what I'm going to go do. And if I'm in my boat, that works. But if I'm not in my boat, I want to have the flexibility that if they're not on offshore rock, I can also fish brush piles or docks or channel swings or shallow flat banks, all all that kind of stuff. So here are a couple examples of areas that may not be good to launch in the kayak. Take this creek, for example. We got Honey Creek. Honey Creek is a great creek. It has a lot of good fish in the times. The problem is that 
the fish are not always going to be on the par- the places here in Honey Creek that are fishable. So, for example, there's a lot of steep banks with boat docks. There's a bridge with riprap. There's a few pockets in the back end, and that's all you got. You got steep banks with docks, the back ends, the pockets, and this bridge right here. That's three things you can try. That's pretty limited in terms of if they're not on those three things and this water clarity, you're screwed. You're SOL. So that's not good. Let's take this creek, for example. This creek has a little bit more diversity. You have some steep channel banks right here. You have some flatter banks over here, backs of pockets, some more rounded points that you could actually try to do some offshore fishing on, some more rounded points, um, some longer creeks with some steep sides and some little secondary pockets. You have a very flat back of a pocket in here. And this is all within like, you know, a mile and a half. Like this is kayak fishable, for example. And so now you're dealing with maybe eight potential things you could do. And if the fish aren't on one of the things you're trying, you have eight other options to try. And, you know, you're going to have to be a lot more versatile, well-rounded as a kayak angler because you're going to have to be able to say, hey, if they're not biting on this steeper bank on boat docks, I need to be able to bump out here offshore catch them offshore potentially, or I might need to go to the steep bank and throw a rock crawler or a jig, or I need to go fish this point with a Carolina rig or jump all the way to the back of the pocket and flip wood or whatever it is. So you have to be a little bit more versatile as a kayak guy. The ideal spot would be right here on uh, the mouth of uh, Snake or Snake Island, the mouth of Horse Creek. In this situation, you have a lot of different stuff going on. You have shallow pockets here that I know have flooded trees and buckbrush. You have a bunch of boat docks right here with some steeper banks. You have a nice steep channel swing bank. You have some offshore structure with some ledges and some points. You have a really flat bay area here with maybe some like isolated wood uh, over here. You have some more deeper drains that run into this creek. So maybe if they're in these drains or ditches, more rounded points a steeper side off this point over here. So you have like 10, 15 options just within like this little zone. If we're going to just do it in like a mile reach, if you wanted to go from here to like here, it's a mile and a half square basically where you have a ton of options right in here. You can even try to get around this corner if you want and get more boat docks. So in a two miles uh, square area, you have a lot more to work with versus even if you went like back in this creek back in here. There's just less options. You only have, there are fewer options. You have maybe six or seven things you can do versus 12 things out here. So if I was going to kayak fish, I would find a two mile square little area that has as many things as possible in it. And there might be multiple places like that. So this might not be the only place that has that. You know, maybe you could find another spot like over here or, or I don't know, somewhere over here. If it were me on Grand Lake, I'd be going right here because this is like my favorite spot in the whole lake is like right in this two mile zone. This is where I would be. And I would just figure out how to catch fish in that zone. Um, Let's see here. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, Aaron, let's see. Um, Will you integrate lake maps into the app at some point? Uh, Casual Bass Guy, that is the goal. Um, Actually, the team of guys I brought on for the, uh, or they brought me on for the app, Um, they actually designed a really cool like 3D weather app before they work with me and they sold that, which is really cool. Um, And they're really good at like mapping technology and stuff like that. So that's where we're going. We needed to get this part of the app launched to make sure people actually like the app before we went and invested the time into doing that. But by the end of the year, there could be some really cool stuff going with the app, put it that way. I I don't talk, I want to get into it too much, but like, there's some pretty mind blowing stuff these guys can do. And that's what we started the goal of, but we needed to make sure the strategies worked and the, the underlying just like core value of the app was good. We weren't going to just put like, you know, a really pretty face on like a piece of crap, like a turd with the strategy. So we wanted to make sure the strategies and everything were really, really good first. That was like number one goal. Then we're going to add features going forward. And we have a new feature launching um, with the effectiveness scores, we're going to add a bunch of really cool stuff over the next few weeks. Um, you know, over the next two, three, four months, you're going to see a lot of new features with this version of the app. And then hopefully at some point we'll get maps and stuff in there. And it's going to be a process. I mean, it's hard to develop and do all this stuff all the time. And we're all still working full-time jobs. So we're still just kind of, I mean, after you fish the moment full-time, they have to, the guys have to do their stuff. So we are 
working our butts off to get really cool features, but that's definitely where we're going with the app. Um, uh, you have all the info you need to fish tournaments. Um, you can spend, uh, you just have to spend 250 days or more to fix the small tips um, that you need. Um, yeah, definitely that's the thing, Dave, is I need to put like a lot more days in the water. Right now I'm fishing like one day a week or like one day every other week. So I'm not fishing enough to put everything into practice um, consistently. I, I'm i pretty good at remembering a lot of it, like while I'm talking and stuff. And even when I'm on the water, I'm pretty good at remembering it and I have a good process for how I approach fishing. But it's just tournament fishing is just a whole new level of stress and anxiety and dealing with other people and people cutting you off and stealing your spots and it's just a whole oh man it's a lot so i want to do it when i don't have to worry about do i have to make a paycheck out of this in my reputation on the line like i don't want to have to worry about that so i I would love i mean one of my end goals would be i would love to fish bassmaster classic i'd love to fish the opens and even when i'm older like i would just fish the opens every year just to have a chance to win an open to fish the classic because that's just like the dream is to be able to ride around the boat go around the classic circle like that's uh that'd be very very cool so that's something that is definitely like a you know childhood dream of mine but um i need to um i i want to be in a better position before i do that just because i don't want uh i know the trolls will come it's like throwing a uh bleeding uh, fish into a sea of sharks. There's going to be all kinds of people coming out of the woodwork. The second I don't catch fish in one tournament, this guy sucks. He's terrible. So I don't, I don't need to open myself up to that right now. That's not really my uh, my my goal. Uh, let's see here. Um, when will your uh, 15 on the water uh, using the app air? I'm going to be posting that actually on uh, Friday. So it'll be, I'm working on it right now. And we actually are, it's, it's, it sucks because I made that video. I caught him. It was great. Um, I caught him on three different strategies to the app. It all worked out perfect. And now we're changing the actual UI of the app to add this effectiveness score. So now it's different by the time the video launches. So I can't just like do the catch 15 video because now the app looks different. And so I have to like re shift it, but the video is coming Friday um, regardless, but I, I did, uh, I didn't actually catch 15 pounds cause it, fishing was really tough that day, but I had a call limit for like, uh, 11 pounds, which was pretty good. Cause it was like flat, calm, no wind and my electronics died halfway through the day. So that was pretty interesting. So I literally had no electronics. I had a pattern rolling guys. If I had my electronics, I would have, I would have finished the 15 pounds, no problem. But then my electronics died and had to go fish old school style with a jerk bait blind. And I still caught them. It was pretty cool. Um, let's see here. Found fish suspended in the middle of a creek with highly stained water. Alabama rig is illegal. What lure is your best option? Um, if you're in highly stained water, like let's say less than two foot of visibility, I wouldn't even bother fishing for those fish. The thing about what happens with those fish, if we go to like a, um, let me pull up. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to pull up grand when it's like really muddy. So if you're in really stained water, the fish that are suspended the, ma- the majority of the way they feed is by, um, <clears throat> they, they either feed with their lateral line or with their vision. So if you're in like a pocket like this, for example, and you have like a foot and a half visibility and the fish are setting up right here in the middle of this pocket like this, or even if it's like, you know, somewhere in here, those fish that are just randomly sitting out there, they're not catchable if there's not enough water visibility. If there's not like two and a half, three foot of visibility where you can put that bait within eyesight of them, very tough to catch. But knowing those fish are there is actually super critical. And this is something I do all the time in my Catch 15 videos. I don't talk about too much because it's just, I have a lot to explain. But a lot of times I'll graph through all of these creeks and I'll see fish suspended here. Let me get rid of this one. Uh, I'll see fish suspended right here. And what'll happen is that they're just sitting there suspended and they're not biting. I, you know, they're not catchable, but later in the day, maybe the sun comes out and warms up this shallow boat ramp right here. Maybe this boat dock or the wind starts picking up and starts blowing into some of this chunk rock bank. You can actually come back to this area and those fish will have moved out of this little drain or gut suspended and move up to the bank and start feeding. So knowing those fish are there, sometimes it doesn't mean that you need to fish for them in that moment, but if those fish are in that spot, there's a pretty good chance that at some point they're going to move up into that area 
to feed if you get some wind, if you get some maybe some better conditions. And I do that all the time, guys. When I'm in my videos, I will graph stuff. And a lot of times I don't ever get to use it because I'll see fish here and the conditions will just never get better and I just don't catch them. And then I don't fish the same lake for like another three months. So I ever use the information. But if I was like practicing for a tournament, that's super useful information. You find these fish set up, suspended out here in front of this pocket. You see the arches on your screen, assuming they're bass. If you can identify them as bass or have a good feeling they're bass, um, then I would just mark this little pocket and say, hey, there's a pretty good chance if the wind starts blowing directly into this bank, it's worth spending 15 minutes to run down this with a spinner bait or a crank bait or something to maybe see if I can get those fish to bite or just come to fish this boat dock. I would roll in here for me personally. I wouldn't probably fish the bank too much, but I might roll in here, just crank just a little bit right here, then fish the boat dock itself, crank a little bit more and then leave or throw a spinner bait or whatever it is and just run that isolated boat dock and then get out of here. If I saw fish on, you know, the graph suspended out here, if that makes sense. <laughs> BK says, jerk a treble hook. You didn't hear it from me. Um, let's see here. Uh, Nicholas says, don't worry about uh, the other people. Other people think you win some, you lose some. Yeah, that's true. It's it's tough, guys, when you're a public figure like this and people are crapping on you. It doesn't do anything good for me uh, personally. I try to be a very positive person. Just keep a pretty good attitude about stuff and like when people are trashing on you like in comments and stuff it's tough i don't know how randy does it randy gets buried i would i would be depressed if i was randy um i don't know what's going on uh cam's asking what app it's the uh, the deep dive app i've been working on it uh it just launched a couple weeks ago you can check it out here um deepdiveapp.com it has a bunch of tournament data that i've collected and it uh, correlates it against real-time lake and weather conditions to give you strategies of where to fish um we launched it a couple weeks ago. Check it out, deepdiveapp.com. You can actually download it for free, guys, and try it. You get one strategy for free. And also, we've been adding a lot of lakes. If you guys have added lakes into the app and they weren't in, you like requested a lake and it wasn't there, one, we had a push notification so we can actually notify you when your app gets added. We, need, we probably should have had that before, but we were trying to get the app out. We did the best we could. But we also have added... We started the app with the with 350 lakes in the app. We basically went all the major lakes, the biggest lakes we could, and we added them, 350 of them. And we got 1,100 requests, and we have like almost, I think we have 1,500 or 1,050 lakes we've added. So 1,050 lakes. We're only like 50 bodies of water short that we added. So, I mean, and to get these lakes, guys, we got to get like the geolocation. We have to pull all the factors so we can correlate it with the thing. We have to pull the current flow, lake levels, all that stuff. So it's a ton of data to pull for one lake. So it took four four of us like the past two weeks to working like nonstop getting those lakes in. So we added all the lakes that we could. Some of them like tidal rivers. We have strategies from tournaments on tidal rivers, but we don't have like the tide charts and stuff. So we're not adding some fisheries in there. Uh, we've added a couple like the Potomac River because some guys were like, we want the Potomac River. And we told them like, hey, you know, we don't have the tide charts in there fully because that's a whole thing. Like we have to, we want to create a feature and stuff for that. Um, and we have all the strategies for the tides, but we just, um, we don't like to put stuff in the app that's not going to be accurate, like super accurate. And actually smallmouth strategies, you can actually change the species from like largemouth to spy bass to smallmouth. And we don't have any smallmouth stuff in there. I'm actually working... Uh, with Matt Steffen here next couple weeks to get a lot of the um, kinks worked out with smallmouth strategies because there's a lot of stuff that you need like specific information on to get that and there's a lot of northern smallmouth behavior that I am like kind of aware of but he knows a lot better than I do so uh, we'll be getting smallmouth in once we feel like the data is good enough for you guys um, let's see here uh, so Randy said that LiveScope users uh, won't get the ladies. What's your view on that statement? I mean, it may be true. I, I only had like two girlfriends before I married my wife. So, um, I mean, I'm married, so that that worked out. But, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much of a ladies' man Randy was before. Uh, um, before. So, I mean, he, he did pose nude in front of his boat. He had the long flowing locks. I mean, he was he was killing it back in the day. So, I don't know. He he could have just been just reeling them in left and right, catching more ladies than bass. I have no idea. So, I mean, it it could be accurate. I I just I don't have enough data to back that up. Um, 
let's see here. Um, oh, don't let the hairs get you down, Johnny. You're doing great. Love the work. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, guys. I appreciate you guys just like, you know, tuning in to hear me nerd out. Um, I didn't have a guest on this week, and I just kind of wanted to. I, I like these video or these live streams where I can just talk to you guys. I just share my thoughts because I have a lot of just random thoughts about fishing. And, like, I mean, guys, you you guys are watching. You guys are great. You're watching me pull up a PowerPoint explaining the different types of shallow versus offshore cover that hold schools of bass. That's pretty nerdy bass fishing stuff, to be honest. So I'm um, very happy that you guys are uh, down to listen to me talk about this kind of stuff because I love it. It's just This is the stuff that, you know, I think about all the time. So I'm just, like, eating up with fishing. I, I love you know, thinking about it, figuring it out. And, um, I love that you guys are here, uh, with me as well, just, um, taking it all in. And so we're actually probably at time here. I do need to pick a, um, um, I do need to pick someone to win this. I'm actually going to go with BK. BK, he says live scope plus no ladies equals more time to fish. I like that idea. So no ladies, live scope, more fish, probably going to be more successful because you have no ladies in your life and live scope. So, Hey, makes you a better fisherman maybe not as good with the ladies but live scope may make you a better fisherman i like that logic there bk so you're gonna be the winner of our free case of bridgeford beef jerky here um all you need to do let me pull up this thing real quick all you need to do is send us an email over at info at fishmoment.com and we'll send over that uh your just send us your mailing address bk um and we'll send that uh, over to bridgeford and they'll send you 12 packs of bridgeford beef jerky full case uh on fish the moment and the guys if you do like the the uh the podcast sorry i'm talking for an hour and a half almost um if you like the podcast and like all the content we have here best way to help support this guys is just to go support our sponsors buy a pack of bridgeford beef jerky at walmart or at the local gas station really really helps out bridgeford they support bass fishermen they support bass fishing just a great company so if you're gonna get a snack anyways for the lake just check out some Bridgeford Beef Jerky uh, next time you're there instead of something else. And again, you're supporting fishing, you're supporting us. And also, if you do have any bass fishing installation needs, if you want um, anything added onto your boat, whether that's live scope or anything like that, check out the Bass Tank over at thebasstank.com. Another sponsor of the show helps make all this possible. And you can just go to thebasstank.com, check out their products. We're actually going to have John Sukup, the owner of the Bass Tank, on next week to talk about some tournament fishing stuff you know geek out more about bass fishing bass fishing theory john john and i always have really good conversations so definitely tune in for that i think it should be a good one and i need to wear a different hat tomorrow uh, or for next tuesday because i know john will wear this hat and it's going to look a little bit weird if we both have these hats also don't give me crap about my hats these are what the sponsors give me this is this flat bill john sent me this one this is what they got so i'm over here just repping the the gear um, that I am given and, um, hopefully, you know, some point people will give me different hats, but this is the hats I get. So I wear them. Um, so, you know, I used to wear the really flat bill caps cause I thought it looked really cool. And I'm looking back at it back in the day and I just look really nerdy and really young. So I'm glad I, I, I'm at least getting a little bit of a bend in the cap. Um, and, uh, I mean, I at least kicked the flat bill cap stuff before I started hanging out with Randy. Otherwise I'd never hear the end of it. Um, anyways, but that is it guys um i'm gonna give in, throw some shade at randy i love randy don't worry don't worry Andy. if you're watching i'm just i'm just giving you a hard time over here and uh, i want to give a cute shout out to a couple of the uh super chats we just got we got sharky ohio appreciate the super chat ten dollars and uh i race for life five dollar super chat it says keep it up johnny appreciate all that guys and i'm gonna try to do some of these um hopefully every single uh, month where i just kind of get on and just talk about some theories and stuff I have, you know, stuff I'm kicking around in my head. Hopefully you guys enjoy that. And I'm also going to try to get a lot more guests on. I got uh, Harvey Horn, uh, Bassmaster Elite Series Pro lined up. Also uh, John Sukup, and I'll have some other pros on as well to kind of round it out. We'll have Randy back on as well, obviously. And we'll just get a uh, uh, different uh, perspectives, different people in, because I want to try to get as much information as I can over to you guys as possible. That's the the number one goal. So anyways, looks like everyone is enjoying this. Um, <laughs> Daniel says he still wants a, uh, a flat bill fish moment. Hat. I have a couple of them in here. I might pull it out for you, Daniel. Um, and uh, just shoot me an email info at fish And I'm, I might try to get one over to you. I have a couple there in my, uh, my closet over here. Uh, flat bill does look uh, cool. <laughs> Good deal. Anyways. Um, 
uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the stream. Hopefully, uh, I mean, I've been talking for so long. When I don't have a guest on, I just talk, and I feel like I'm just, like, losing everything by the end of it. But hopefully you guys are enjoying. You're still here, so if you are still here and you have uh, been on the stream, just leave a like down the video. Really appreciate it, too. It just helps with the algorithm and stuff like that. Helps the sponsors. So, anyways, thanks, guys. We'll see you next week with John Sook up on the stream. I'll have a little bit of time to think and uh, interact with the chat more, answer your questions. If I missed a question, I apologize. I'm just trying to keep talking so there's not like these awkward silences so anyways thanks again guys i hope you have a great night best of uh, luck this week if you go fishing and we'll see you next tuesday same time same place uh see you have a great week